in a thank you word address. Jeff and good evening to the family, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We are again together to say that table and feast on the word and be encouraged and be enlightened by it. I remember my aim, as I would repeat again, is not just for us to discuss and dialogue and share opinions about the word, but it's really to help create um, a deeper desire for us to study the word in, in more depth and detail since we really see the number of things that can be unfold before us when we look deeply into the world. So it's to make you more studious and make you more meticulous about things that you read in the Bible and give more depth to your research and understanding because then we get more meaning and we get better understanding. So I'm hoping that the whole process will be creating better students of the word in, in all of us. As we share together, we see how we can interpret things differently. We can do things differently. And yet we can still recognize that our differences will have to divide us or cause any animosity among us. But that we will learn together and go deeper in our understanding of the word together. So I hope that we keep that in our mind and that at the end of our series, we would have a greater desire you know, to, to learn more and, and search more and, and go beyond the surface because we get a lot of meaning from the word when we do that. Now I've recognized that over the last couple of sessions that people tend to have most of the questions at nine o'clock when we are about to close the session. And I have been given opportunity for you to ask your questions. And it seems like you know you, you delay and then we go beyond our time. I remember our session is supposed to go from 7.30 to 9 o'clock, which I really want to honor. So what I would do is try to give a little more opportunity earlier as we go through our session for you to ask some questions. What I will do is by a quarter to nine, I will make sure that I will finish the presentation so you will have a 15 minute period there to ask any questions or make any comments that you want to and give us time to dialogue so that we could close by nine o'clock. If we have to go a little over because there are some questions that, you know, will have come up and we have to get resolved, but then we can go a little after, but it wouldn't want us to be going to, to 9.30 because then some people will have, have to leave the session and we'll miss some of the responses that are, are given. So bear that in mind, so while I'm going through the session, you know, you can jot your questions down so when opportunity comes, or, or statements, it may not be necessarily a question, but something that you would want to say uh, to give some insight or enlightenment on our on our discourse. So you can you can do that, and so we can accomplish a lot in the time that we have available. Now, what I want to do tonight is to look at the the, the third um, timeline, because you remember I told you that. There were two persons that had uh, a similar timeline, which will result in the lens of crucifixion, but they were, they were starting from, from different points. So in our first session, we looked at those who would be looking at the Friday crucifixion and their rationale and their analysis from what they would have read in the Gospels. And then I looked last week at Dr. Our Ed Torres timeline, where he would have started from the 15th as the Passover. And he analyzed the, the information given in the Gospels. And he arrived at the Wednesday as the crucifixion um, did. But remember, we, we were discussing uh, what came out also in the Gospel narrative is that the tradition would have changed through time. And, and there were occasions where the Jews would have referred to the 
14th at the Passover, and there were other occasions where they referred to 15th at the Passover. And then there were, were times where they were basically considered the Passover as, as, as the whole week celebration. So that's why he wanted for us to look at those who would start the Passover on the 14th and those who would use the 15th as the, the day which they believe the gospel that have been referred to. Even as we read the gospels, we saw a reference made as if it was you know, taking into consideration the fact that sometimes the Jews mention the, the 14th as the Passover, and on other occasions they mention the 15th as the Passover. And even today, many of, of the Jews, the modern Jews celebrate the Passover on, on, the, on the 15th. So since we saw where the timeline brought us looking at it, starting um, from the 15th, we were looking at John chapter 12 as a very important timeline. And basically we're examining all three positions using John chapter 12 as the basis. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany and had supper. And we were calculating that six day period and where it would have started from. Now using Therese analysis, six days before the 15th, brought us to the Friday, which is the 9th. Well, I'm looking at the other um, option, um, that another well, the scholar would have used as his method of trying to establish the timeline, where he starts from the 14th as the Passover that John perhaps would have been referring to. And so that when he says six days before the Passover, it's six days before the 14th, and not six days before the 15th, as R.A. Tori had indicated. But as I told you, it is not a, a real big issue with, with these variations because of the sense of what was happening among the Jewish tradition of sometimes referring to the Passover as, as the 14th, starting the 14th, and, and others referring to it as the actual feast day, as the feast of the Passover, which would have been on the 15th, because the, the feast followed the actual killing of the lamb, which took place on the evening of the 14th. So I indicated to you that even when we use the timeline started from the 14th, it still brings us back to the Wednesday position, and that's interesting. So I just wanted to show you that we will not go into as long of a discourse and a dialogue because we will have basically the same details, it's just that it's adjusted by one day difference. And then after I present that, I will give a little break. So if you want to make any comments or ask any questions, you can do that. So this particular, this particular um, pass over the name of Matthew Norville um, has the position of the six days before the Passover that John refers to in the 16th, in the six days then before the 14th. So six days before the 14th, we bring us to the 8th, whereas what we saw last week, six days before the 15th brought, up, brought us to the 9th. And then the following day, which was the 10th, Jesus would have entered Jerusalem, which we would call the triumphal entry, which would have been Saturday, which would have been the variation from what was traditionally taught to us, and what we have traditionally accepted as the beginning of the Holy Week, as the Palm Sunday, because those who were of the Friday position calculated the six days before that John was speaking about started on Saturday, and then the following day, Jesus was born in to Jerusalem. Our etory started from the 15th, six days took him to the 9th, which was the Friday, and then his following day that John referred to in John chapter 12, verse 12, the following day, Jesus went into Jerusalem, would have then taken you to Saturday as the triumphal entry and not the Sunday. Now, Pastor Norville, starting from the 14th, as his beginning point, calculating then six days, as John mentioned before the Passover, that Jesus came to Bethany, then he would start the Thursday, which is one day ahead, because that would be the eighth. Six days from the 14th would bring you to the eighth. So his, his timeline then will begin from Jesus coming in to Bethany on the eighth, having supper with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, 
And then as John refers to timeline, the following day, he went into Jerusalem, he would actually be saying that the entry, the triumphal entry will be the Friday. So we had one group saying Sunday, which would be Palm Sunday, one group saying the Saturday, and his position now starting from the 14th would have brought him to the Thursday, he entered, and the Friday, he went into Jerusalem from Bethany, which would be his triumphal entry. But then his following day would be the ninth, and then he would arrive at Saturday, the 10th. So Thursday would be the eighth, Friday would be the ninth, and he would still come to Saturday at the 10th, which is when he went back into Jerusalem and we saw that he spoke the money changers, et cetera, et cetera. So we would move then basically from there and follow the same pattern that Turin would, would follow. And it would bring us back to the, the Wednesday because his two days now before the, the Passover, which we saw in Matthew and we saw in Mark, where they accounted to two days before, that was his Sunday. So he would he would arrive then at having the two days before the Passover, giving you the Monday and the Tuesday, and then the Wednesday would have been the Passover. Because remember, we indicated that there were italics in those two passages where Matthew and John, sorry, Matthew and Mark mentioned the feast of the Passover, and those italicized words, as we said, indicate that they were not in the original, but they were added by those persons who were doing the translation. So he took out those two words, feast of, to indicate that he was not making, or he don't think that the writers were making a direct reference to the 15th, but they were making a reference to the 14th, which they would have been considered as the Passover. And so the words feast of the, which makes people very often inclined to think of the feast of unleavened bread. Then you see the word feast, and would be inclined to think 15th. He is saying that the original text would have had the feast, the, would have had two days before the Passover, which would mean then that when Jesus would have been in that place on that day, he mentioned his disciples that. Passover was coming in, in, in the next two days. Those two days will be referring now to Tuesday, to Monday and Tuesday pass. And then the Wednesday will bring you to, to what he would consider as the, the day for the crucifixion, which is, which is Wednesday. So he will still technically come back to the same position that our, our Ettore had. The, the only issue I will have with his timeline is that then, if Jesus went into Jerusalem on the on the ninth, which would have been the Friday. Then we will not be able to calculate the four days in which the Passover lamb was kept as the parallel, because you would have to start from the Saturday as the entry. And if we believe that the triumphal entry, because as I said, most Bible commentators tend to think that the Triumphal entry on the Saturday represented the selecting of the Lamb. That Jesus was identifying himself as the selection of the Lamb. Pastor Norval is basically saying that for him, that Saturday, yes, represents when the Jews would have selected their Lamb to be held for the four day period to be slain on the Wednesday, which would be four days after. So he does not tie the parallel to Jesus' entry being the selection of the Lamb. He just looked at it as what the original tradition would have been in terms of what was established by God. So select the Lamb on the 10th day, keep it for four days, and then kill it in the evening. So all his conclusion would have been is that that is just the regular day, the 20th, the Saturday, the 10th, sorry, which would be the day that they would be selecting the lab. So it was still tied in in terms of the timeline with what our A Tory indicated, indicating that 
the lamb was selected on 10th and kept for the fourth, fourth day. So as I said, the only um, issue we have, if we, we are considering the parallel, we must, must follow right through. And that Jesus from the end of Jerusalem would have been the parallel to the lamb being selected. It would more likely then fit in to the Saturday as the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So if I were to, to form my own analysis of all the scriptures that we have examined and the whole um, timeline and the parallel that was established by God in the original context from what would have been established in the book of Exodus, I am inclined to accept um, Corey's analysis that the timeline will start from the triumphant entry on Saturday rather than Sunday because that will actually represent the selecting of, 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 of the Lamb, Jesus being the Lamb. It will also correspond with the Jews making their selection on that day, getting the Lamb ready for the sacrifice. And it will actually calculate to four days, the fourth day on the Wednesday, which will then parallel is when the Jews would have killed their Passover lamb, and when Jesus would have been killed, or when he would have been crucified. So the parallel will hold through. And then the day following, established by God, not by the Jewish tradition, that was established by God, and the Jews were commanded to observe that, which, which they did for, for several years. The following day would have been the Passover Sabbath, concluding, therefore, then that when the Bible mentions that Jesus was crucified the day before the Sabbath, he was crucified the day before the Passover Sabbath, which began the Feast of the Unleavened Bread on the Thursday. And we have already established, and we did the count, to show that we will get three days and three nights coming from the, the, the starting from the Thursday and going to the Sunday. And at the ending of that Sabbath period, Jesus would have been resurrected because as we will see when we examine the, when they go to the tomb, that the, the, the scriptures do indicate that they went to the tomb early in the morning, but it does not specify that Jesus rose um, early Sunday morning. So my personal opinion is that I would be inclined to accept that there's more evidence from what we have read from the accounts given in, in the Gospels and look at the timeline and compare with the prototype or the parallel that God would establish. And I believe that they're to be fulfilled in all details in the life of Christ. And yes, but the weeks did mention that there are a number of other references in, in the, the word, in the, in, in the Gospels that do not specify three days and three nights. Jesus indicated that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, and used the parallel of Jonah. And I believe that that was the precedent that was set. So even though in, in some of the other passages, you will see on the third day or in three days or after three days, and not necessarily three days and three nights in all the other accounts, because in, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in John, you see reference being made at times so Jesus saying, or other persons saying, that even the scribes of the Pharisees, when they wanted to make sure that Jesus would have been guarded, they said the deceiver said that he would um, lay down his life and after three days, he would be resurrected. So we got to make sure that we guard the tomb. So this statement didn't say three days and three nights either. And there are references, when you look at the text, I believe that many of you would have read them. And when we alluded to that, that there were a number of references where it just said after three days or on the third day or in three days or within three days. So I believe that the precedent was set by Jesus. And even though those statements would not have mentioned um, consistently three days and three nights, I believe that that is what um, is the intention of Jesus since he said that that is what is going to bear testimony of him being the Messiah, that that would be a precise timeline that we establish and that he would function in relation to that timeline. 
that's why we saw that Jesus would go into Jerusalem and he would go out to Bethany in the evening because he knew that there were attempts being made to arrest him. And we saw from one of the texts that the Pharisees and the Pharisees were actually planning to do that, but they said they, they've got to make sure they don't do it on the feast day because they were free and hot road. But what I'm saying is that whatever they were planning, God had established a timeline and that was going to be carried out in, in a meticulous, detailed way because that's the way that God functions. Now, sometimes people would want to conclude that the date doesn't really matter or the day doesn't really matter. Um, it, it's the event. But I would want to say that events are connected to, to timelines and to dates. The Passover was established by God with particular date references and particular timelines. And if God established a timeline, it has to be significant because he could have made the statement without having a timeline. God could have just said in the prophecies that Jesus is going to be crucified and he's going to be resurrected from the grave. And, and this is the act of atoning for our sin. So if God gives us a specific timeline, I believe it is significant. And we should not on the, you know, on the play the significance of it simply because we, we be, believe that the event, while it is, is important, is what we should give the consideration to. But no, the event is connected to a timeline which was established by God. I believe that once it is, it's important that we understand the timeline, we accept the truth of the timeline and recognize that we have been functioning within a tradition that has not been based on the timeline. So we would want to believe that because we were functioning in that timeline for a period of time, that, that is what really matters. Jesus was crucified and Jesus was resurrected and that's what we celebrate. But the truth of the matter is that the, the timeline indicates the, the, the power of God to determine things and bring them into effect. That's why it is it's significant. So it's, it's not just an event, but it's a timeline and a time schedule that, identified, that is identified by God. And he's basically showing us how much control he has over times and events. And that things have to fall into line with what he has established or he has determined. That's why it is significant and that's why we must pay careful attention to it and, 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 and stick to the truth because it also identifies the reality and the credibility of the Bible in, in actually identifying the truth to what God has identified. So for me, the truth is still important. Traditions, people will want to stick to traditions, but I believe the truth is still important and people must know the truth. And then we will recognize that, hey, this is a tradition that we have come to identify with and have practice and observe. But the reality is the date does not correspond to what is identified in the narrative coming from the gospel accounts. And so we need to know that and establish that. And when people question then the reliability of the Bible and challenge us um, as to how we are, are going to reconcile what the, the, the Bible would have been indicated and what we are practicing in relation to the, the crucifixion um, timing of Christ that shows error in the Bible, whereas it does not show error in the Word. Like I said earlier, there are Bible commentators who indicate that the problem with the Bible is not really the text, but it's the translators and the interpreters of the text. But the Bible is reliable, it is credible, and it is not contradictory and it's authentic. And once we abide by the truth and we identify the truth and we proclaim that truth, then people will understand that the Bible is accurate and we are the persons who will have made the error. They believe that the error was made in thinking that the day before the Sabbath was the seventh day Sabbath and that was the conclusion. I don't believe it's, it's a malicious attempt to deceive anybody um, or to establish a tradition which is based on falsehood. I believe it's just an error that was made. And so once it became established and practiced and it's not a challenge or question and become an established position, that's what we settled into accepting. But 
my, my understanding from the word and what I would declare is that I believe the text indicate and I have the, the enough um, reason from what we read in the narratives that they, they all point to Jesus being crucified on the Wednesday. So we have accurately three days and three nights in the tomb and resurrected at the ending of the Sabbath because John, sorry, Psalms had indicated, David had indicated that Jesus would not see corruption. And remember from the account of Lazarus, when they indicated that he would begin to stink because he would not go into the fourth day, having been dead, and that's when corruption starts to set in. Jesus would have had to come up at the exact time period that was played, the three days of the three nights, so that no corruption was set in his body. We also recognize what would have been seen, no. what was seen, sorry, what was seen to be a minor detail, but again, it was in prophecy that Jesus would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, the court of an ass, as it has been indicated. And again, that might seem to be a minor detail, but, but God placed that in the heart of a prophet who prophesied it would happen. So it has to be significant because he didn't come in on a horse or a mule, or a camel, as it indicated already, he came in on the donkey. And that was, that was prophesied. So I believe all the details then are connected to the, the prototype or the, or the parallel. Uh, we, we have to take as important and, 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 and stick with that as, as the biblical truth or the biblical timeline. So that's my personal view. It might differ from other people's view. I, I believe that the error was made, and we can see how the error would have been made. And I show you last week that there are actually two cells, and, and that would explain some of the information given in the accounts, help us to understand how the women could have walked spices after the Sabbath, and then the word indicate they rested on the, the, the Sabbath and went to the tomb the following day. Those two accounts could, could only make sense if there were two Sabbaths and that they rested after the Passover Sabbath, went and bought the spices on the Friday, which would be a normal day, and prepared them, then rested again on the seventh day Sabbath, and then went to the tomb early Sunday morning to find that Jesus was resurrected. Now, so for me, because Friday is really the, the wrong date that has become established as the crucifixion date. Now, the resurrection, I, as I said, will not have a major issue with, with, the, with the timeline that we use and, and we are celebrating the Sunday as, as the resurrection because there is a very thin line between the, the ending of the Sabbath and the beginning of the new day, which is the Sunday. So there's very close proximity there. And even if Jesus arose just after the Sabbath had ended, he would not still be going in to completing another night um, in the tomb. It was just maybe a matter of seconds or, or so. And, and but the fact that the women went to the tomb early in the morning and the announcement was made and declared that Jesus had risen, I have no problem. I see that as no issue of, of the celebration. Of, of the resurrection as the Sunday. It's a, it's a celebration time and, and, it, and it's not really um, inaccurate in a sense because it would be still pretty close um, to the, the timeline I identified. Now, there are some people that would have asked why could we have set the date for the crucifixion and the resurrection and how we establish a specific date for Christmas? We observe that day wherever it falls. But the idea was that Jesus would have been resurrected, as they say, from what was proclaimed on the Sunday. So the resurrection day was established on the Sunday, and then you would have backtracked from that. But obviously, even if you set dates, what will happen is that the day will change, and then you will create um, particular issues or confusion. I have no problem establishing a day 
and you're observing the celebration of the day rather than the date because the date is going to bring changes and you will have to reestablish a whole lot of things then to determine when you'll be celebrating those things. I don't think there's any need for us to even consider that. There, there were uh, attempts to fix the, 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 the date for Easter, what we, what we call Easter or the resurrection. Uh, that has never really been, been, been established. And so it's going to keep moving because what was officially decided at the Council of Nicaea um, by Constantine is that it would be the Sunday, which comes after the, the equinox, the first full moon. And that's what traditionally has come to be part of, of the culture and the observance. And that's what happened happens in relation to the resurrection Sunday. So yes, Jesus would have, would have been crucified on the 14th of, of Nisan. He would have risen from the dead three days after. So if we had fixed dates corresponding in our Gregorian calendar to the, the, the timing of it, whether it was April the 3rd or April the 7th, for some people um, want to debate the corresponding date. Some people say April the 17th. And, and you get variations in terms of what is the corresponding date on the Gregorian calendar. So what would it be the 14th of Nisan when Jesus is fine? That is what people have been trying to dial out or to fix the time. Because every 14th, the Jews will have observed the Passover. On uh, whatever day that fell on, it was observed as the Passover. And whatever day the Feast of Unleavened Bread fell on, that would have been observed as the Sabbath. So, so according as time moved, while the period was fixed, the, the actual day would have, would have been changing. We just saw we, we had the 14th would have been on Wednesday and the 15th would have been on Thursday. And as we said, even um, Ashland projects indicated that it's the moon which is in the middle of the, of the Jewish month, but it coincided with the Thursday. But I said, I really just, you know, see that as, as maybe relevant information. I, I really try to go with the biblical timeline and, and try to, to select um, the period based on that, rather than putting the trust and the confidence, even though there might be some credibility, the timelines uh, established in astronomy, but we get variations in those. So we can't even fix those. So that is where you will get complications in trying to establish a fixed date for these things. And, and then they say you have slight calendar adjustments made from the Jewish calendar, the Julian calendar, and the Gregorian calendar, which would call for some analysis. But it would have been possible if you wanted to, um, to fix those specific dates. So you know when Jesus would have been crucified. And three days after when he would have been resurrected. But then you would end up changing um, time periods and, and days, just like you would have changes in Christmas. Because Christmas doesn't fall on the same day every year. It means that you will have had that. So to avoid those variations, will determine that they fix the resurrection, which they will refer to as Easter, based on traditions which we would have discussed before. So I would rather um, not use the term Easter, even though. Acts chapter 12, I think it is, there is a mention of the word Easter, and that's an insertion again by the translators, because the, the Hebrew word, Hishash, and the Greek word, Pascal, are the words that were used in that text that was translated as Easter. Some people say that that was just placed there because they wanted to use Easter to represent dawn, rather than a, a, a traditional pagan festival, but the reality is, is that the word Easter is not in, the, in the, tra the traditional language, and the word Easter is not a word that was ever used in the first century church by the disciples and the followers of Christ. They would have used Passover. So, in, in summary, then, we have different positions identified in relation to the timeline. And Friday has become accepted traditionally as the resurrection day, and Sunday as the resurrection day, and that's the majority 
of, of the um, Christian church churches. But we're back to the Bible and from what we have indicated in the scriptures, the me, the timeline that, that, that comes out is that Jesus would more likely have been crucified on the Wednesday, then three days or three nights in the tomb resurrected at the ending of the Sabbath as it began to turn over onto the, the Sunday. So we have an established position that we observe as tradition for Friday, the Friday and Sunday, um, Resurrection Sunday or commonly termed Easter. But it does not match the timeline that we indicated from the word. Uh, the three days and the three nights will fall apart. Uh, even if we try to make any adjustment that we can with part of the day or part of the night, it still can't even match that accurately what Jesus would have been indicating. And even if he says, well, there are other parts of the Gospels that do not have three days and three nights, they mention in three days or after three days, and whatnot, you still can't get that using from Friday to Sunday. You more likely will, will get the analysis indicating from Wednesday to the ending of the, of the Sabbath. Saturday. So pause there, or if you want to make any comments or ask any questions or make yes, any impressions that you want to, I will give you the opportunity to do that. Yeah. And then we will start then to analyze some of what we call um, variations which people claim as contradictions. And we will look at from the narrative which we deal deals with the, the anointings because that's one that has caused you know some major contention and debate and then we will proceed from there all right so i break at this point all right reverend jackman you have two questions reverend leaks and then um his hand was up first and then sandra pollard boston so reverend leaks sandra pollard boston yes yes please good night pastor good night to you yes please all right i have I have a couple of things now. I understand the timeline. Yes. And 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 we can't really escape the timeline. Now, I think that we're going to run ourselves in trouble if we don't deal with the dates. Because if you have a timeline, those dates are, are established. You can't change the 14th and you cannot change the resurrection. Right. So in that case, then, we are still using the resurrection as an event because we're not celebrating the actual day. Right, we are using it as an event because, as they said, we, we will have we want to avoid now the complications that will arise if we try to fix dates. Right. But 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 in that case, then we are still not going with the biblical model in the sense that we are using an event instead of a date. Because I'm saying every year Nissan or Nissan, um, th those days will shift according to our calendar. Those not fixed days. Sorry, the, the date moves. The, the date is the same. The day will change. Yes. So, Right, so right. I'm saying then that we have it locked in because of Sunday, you know, because watch it, we have resurrection because of the But you are right, you are right, Reverend Weeks, it has been locked in because of Sunday, because what that is established, everything comes back from there, you know, they haven't locked in from the crucifixion, they locked it in from the Sunday. Correct, correct, and I think it's because they want to be, the, the, when Christ was, was, was risen for the dead, it was a Sunday, when they went to yes. the, the tomb, so people want right. to keep that in their heads. Right, they, they want to establish Sunday as a fixed day. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Right. But again, and, and again, and again, we lock in no pass over as 15 days after that. For right. Sunday, for Sunday again. Yes. Right. So again, we have to understand the truth that you are putting now, but still understand that the Sunday is not the actual date or the or the actual day, it is an event. That's what they want to be. Very correct, very correct. You are very accurate, Brother Leeks. Yes, you see, because as they said, the council at Nicaea established what they wanted. Again, as, as, as I said, there are a lot of customs that we have in the church that were established on the Roman Catholicism. And we're going to realize that. And the tradition that we observe that are not directly and significantly connected to Christ, but they were locked in by the Catholic Church, which, which was the established church. And the universal church at that time, they had the power and the authority to establish these things. And that's what they did. And, and, and while it is a Sunday, as you are actually correct, they even determined what Sunday it will be. 
that it will be the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox. Now, the, now the equinox is fixed according to the Earth's um, rotation and, and the, the orbit of the moon. The equinox always occurs on the 21st of March. So that Easter, and I'm using Easter as a traditional term, could, ne could never occur before the 21st of, of March, not after the 25th of April. So Easter is going to happen some somewhere in between there. So it was determined that Easter would be the Sunday. Yes, so you're right, Fred. Continue if you have some other points to make. No, I can pause for no pastor. Thank you. Okay, all right. All right, Sandra Pollard, Bostick, and then um, Sir Richard, Richard Lord. Hi. <clears throat> Good night. Can everybody hear me? Good night. Hello. Hello. I'm here. You. I'm here. You, Sandra. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we. Oh, great. Um, okay. Hey, good night. Hey, Eddie. Yeah, just, uh, okay, if following the timeline, which seems logical with having a restriction on the Wednesday, but I just had a small question then about the, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which then yeah. puts that on a Saturday. Yes. Um, and that would yeah. have been a, a Passover, well, not a Passover, that would have been a Sabbath for the Jews. Um, yes. So I was just wondering, that seems to be like an awful lot of activity to be taking place on one of their weekly Sabbaths. I, I always thought that the Sabbath was, you know, minimal activity, etc. But it seems to be a fair, a, a sizable amount of, you know, activity taking place on that Saturday, which would have been a Sabbath. So I just wondered if there were any thoughts around that. All right, that's, that's, that's a good question. And that's, that's an interesting point. And that's why the, the other person who I presented tonight with his timeline, he was more inclined to, to want to go for the Friday at the Triumphal entry because, again, he was looking at that as a Sabbath. But remember I said last week that Jesus will have to travel from Bethany to Jerusalem anyhow. So he's traveling on the Sabbath. But there are certain things that were allowed to be conducted as part of the custom on a Sabbath. Now, Jesus was questioned and challenged for healing on the Sabbath, which was forbidden. He was questioned for plucking fruit on the Sabbath. And Jesus questioned them about necessities that are part of observance. And remember, he said, if a, if a camp in there, there us, tell it well, if they were not going to take it on the Sabbath, which should, should be saying that there's a time for necessity. So the Jews allowed a short distance of travel on Sabbath, which I indicated referred to as a Sabbath day's journey. Um, if, if you go for precision, it was usually just about under a mile. But Jesus was obviously going from Bethany to Jerusalem have a travel more a mile. So if you're if you're traveling to the Sabbath, they allow a short distance because if people are going from Bethany to Jerusalem for worship on the Sabbath, they have to travel. But it's a short distance, which according to the, to the tradition of the Jews, you have been allowed to travel. But if Jesus was moving from Jericho to, to come to Bethany, he will not have been traveling on the Saturday. That's why um, Tori's point of him moving the Friday and getting in on the Friday evening would avoid a distance of over 15 miles he would have to travel. That would be actually a breach of the law because the distance is too far. Now, the activity is, all it is, is that they were just laying palms in the street as a welcoming sign for a, a, a person of honor. And that's a, tra a tradition that Jews would have had. Now, you were saying, yes, it occurred on the Sabbath, but they would be going to the temple for worship. And here is the person at that point in time that they identified as Hosanna the prayed, blessed is he that cometh in the, in the name of the Lord, right? They, they, they recognize Jesus as, as a person of, of honor. It's sad that they, they were crucifying him then um, days after. So, so for, for them, that may not have been considered an unreasonable uh, activity on that day because it's just as giving honor to somebody by laying farms in in, 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 the, in the street. But you are right. Uh, and, and some people have, have mentioned that as, as something to consider if Jesus did go in on the Saturday and not the Sunday as Palm Sunday, that he would have been having activity on, on that day. 
Uh, he still met the Jerusalem any Holy Sunday, so you have to travel to get to Jerusalem. And it is just that the people were honoring him by laying the palms in, in the street. And, and then on, that, on the Saturday is when they would have been making the selection of, of, of their lambs. Uh, I, I don't know if there would be any buying and selling on, on that day because that again would have been going against your tra tradition. And that's why Jesus would have been very upset with the activity that would perhaps been going on in the temple when he would have arrived in, in, in the city, right? But yes, I can see that that's a point that you could, you could, you could challenge a question. But as I said, just that the Jews allow for travel um, on the Sabbath, there are certain things that they allow for. Because that could be form, as they say, of honoring a person. But the point that you're making, yes, is activity that is going to take place on Sabbath because it would have been Saturday. All right, Elder Lord, you yes, have sir. a comment or question? Yeah, good night. Good night. Yes, good night to you, my Lord. Yes, I want to know about the Last Supper. Was this a Passover meal? No, it would not. It would not have been a traditional Passover meal. Reason why? Because the Passover meal involved the eating of the lamb. And again, the customs started to adjust. There were, there were some people that started eating the lamb from even on the 14th. Because remember, from three o'clock to six is the, is the period given to the killing of the lamb. Because as soon as you go across over six, you go into the Sabbath. So there's no killing of the lamb. But, but it was to be roasted and prepared. And then as soon as you turn into the Thursday, which we did, with the, with the Sabbath following the slain of the lamb. But remember, the Jews, they start from the next time. So Thursday would have been following on. The, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread would have been actually in the, in the night time. And they would have been feasting on the lamb, plus the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread. Now what we see in the accounts given in the Gospels is that Jesus broke bread and he drank wine. There's no, there's no bread a record or mention of him eating of the lamb. So technically, then he would not have observed the traditional Passover feast, mm. which would have started on the 15th, the following um, evening coming on, because he would not have been around. He would, yeah. And he is the lamb. He is the lamb that was going to be, to be slain. So while the Jews were killing their lamb, Jesus was being sacrificed for us. That's why we say we don't have to slay the lamb anymore. Someone has taken the place of the lamb. He is the great I am. So Jesus was taking that place. So he could not have been sacrificed to be offered before the time. And so he would not have been there to have eaten the, the traditional Passover. That's why he observed it as a token with his disciples, but they asked him, Master, where are we going to, to go to prepare the Passover? Because in their mind, they didn't see Jesus dying on the Wednesday. They thought that yeah. Jesus was going there for the Passover, the eating of the lamb, the 15th. But Jesus knew he was a, that's why he said, I desire to eat it with you. Desire, not yeah. I'm going to be eating it. He's not going to be eating it because he's not going to be there to eat it. So he took the, the bread, and as, and as I say, the scripture that he broke the bread, it doesn't say it was on 11 bread. It's a possibility it could have been that he would have still observed part of the custom and have used on 11 bread and, and drank the wine, had his last supper, which we refer to as the, as the, as the last supper, which we observe, mm. because Jesus knew that he would not have been there to celebrate the traditional feast of the eating of the lamb with the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread on the Thursday because he would have been already dead at three right. o'clock on the Wednesday. Right, okay. All right. Okay. All right, any more questions before we get into some 
Deep Warder is here now. All right, so we can proceed. So we can get some time in for some more questions. All right. Now, what is critical to our whole analysis and debate? As I say, that's why truth is important. That's why we have to state the details in a meticulous way because we have to defend the credibility, the authenticity, and the trustworthiness of the Bible as it relates and as it gives events and timelines and time periods and accounts. Because if we can't trust it in its entirety and it has issues, then we're going to have problems in defending that word that we rely on for the preaching of the gospel and, and our faith based on what has been transmitted to us in the word. Because basically our Christianity is based on what we have received in the word. And so we have to look for where people challenge it and question it. And that's when my position is that I would I would defend the range of prescription because it matches what would have been projected in the word. The Bible has also been challenged for accounts given at, in, in terms of the four gospels at the, the, the resurrection. And it has also been challenged in terms of the crucifixion, the details, because we have some slight nuances in, in the way um, the, the, the gospel writers record these events, which we have to look at. Because people are saying that there are errors, there are contradictions, and therefore the Bible is not inerrant. As you say, it is, it is full of a whole lot of issues and problems, and you can't defend it. And if you can't defend it across the board, then when I challenge it for my belief, I think that you have the wrong interpretation. You can't really tell me that I'm wrong because I can show you errors in the Bible, and areas where you um, cannot defend these things. So that's what we want to look at now. We want to start with the anointings because they are very much connected to this whole event connected to Christ's uh, final days. Interesting thing is that we have four accounts given, which I, I told you to research. I hope you, you did research them. And before I interject here and to give any analysis, I want you to tell me if you saw any discrepancies, if you think that those four accounts given I gave to you in Luke, in Matthew, Mark, and John, if they show contradictions or have discrepancies because they are the same event and the information given is different, and then it puts the Bible in trouble. And it's the same event. And we have these different accounts given in the Gospels. Or could it be more likely that they're not the same event? And that is why we get different details because we are not dealing with the same event. So people who challenge the Bible will be wrong because they are assuming that it's the same event that is misrepresented by some of the writers. Whereas we could conclude that it's not the same. Now, what have you discovered from your reading? I hope you have done your homework and you're good students. Again, I'm giving you the time now for you to talk to me before I interject. So we get a more chance to dialogue. So maybe finish at nine o'clock. We, we have covered what we need to cover. So we are only dealing tonight then with, with these accounts here see what we gather from them. the anointings of Jesus. Are they all the same? Did they occur at the same time? Are they related to the same event? Or are they different? Are there discrepancies and contradictions? Or can we defend the accounts? Because we don't understand what the writers are showing us. So I pause again. If I get too much of a delay, but then I have to proceed and we will look at them. But you talk to me and tell me what issues you have come up with. If I get too much of a delay, I'm going to assume that you have not done my homework and I have to find a means of punishing you. But I hope I won't have to do that. Okay, I've uh, seen that um, Ms. Sanja Pollard Bostic has um, suggested that there seem to be two different events. Perhaps she wants to um, explain further. Go ahead. 
All right. All right. She says two different events. Hearing again? Oh. Yeah. Sandra, go ahead. Well, they have, yeah, Eddie, it appears to be two. different anointings because the Gnostic Gospels, they seem to suggest yeah. that it is one woman and in two of them she's described as, or at least in one of them as a sinful woman. But then John's account, it, which is the six days before the Passover, the anoint, this anointing was done by Mary, who I assume is Martha's sister. <clears throat> and it says that Mary anointed Jesus' feet um, with the expensive perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. But the other woman that is mentioned in the other uh, Gospels, um, she poured the perfume on his head. Mm -hmm. At least in Matthew, she, she poured it on his head. And then she... But then in Luke, it says as well that she wrapped at his feet and, and, um, and also poured the perfume on his feet. But I assume it's still, I, I think it's, it's two different women. Mary is the one referred to in John. And then this other woman who is only called um, a sinful woman is the, the second one. All right. So, so, so question to you. So you were settled for two, two different events um, and not three. Hmm. Well, prior to just now, I was I was looking at two, but no, I don't know no, if um, it ah, would be right, a you were looking third. at two. Uh, right. I was looking really at two, but no, two. that looking okay. over. All right, no, no problem. Some people look at two. There's some people who say that it's one, all in the same, and that they, they, they are mistakes. And there is, and there are some who see three. So they said we would analyze the accounts and see if it's one, two, or three. I would say so there are at least two, but at I'll least have to look two. Over right. Yes, this is the third. Yeah. Right. So you will say at least two. So you will say um, conclusively that is not one and the same event being related. Correct. That is the way right. I am okay. seeing it from here. Yeah. All right. Good. I'm, I'm with you on that. Okay. I got to look a little closer. And as you said, we see different responses from the Marys and different things being done. All right, so that's the difference, but we can account for that. That can be reconciled because a writer does not have to give all the details, but it does not mean that they're not correct. One could have said that he anointed the head and the feet. One writer might have just said, mention the feet, but it does not mean that there is a, a, a contradiction. It's just in the way it's related. All right, so thank you for that contribution, Sandra. Right, so you're right on, at least it's seeing that there is a difference. All right, any other interjections? Anybody who see one event related in different ways? All right, no response. Let's let's pick up from the first one in Luke chapter seven. We're going to look at them. Luke chapter seven, and that starts from verse eleven. No, sorry, they start from verse thirty-six. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And I don't know if you would agree with me when I, when I say um, that this is a completely different event. It is not, to me, even connected to the others in the, in the, in the, um, in the other Gospels. And you will tell me, um, if you agree with me, when I tell you my analysis. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. In Luke chapter 7, I read it from verse 36. And behold, a woman, all right, there's no specified name there, watch that. 
a woman in the city which was a sinner. So some people say that that's just a euphemistic way of saying that she was a prostitute. But it might not be necessarily the case, but sometimes they, they use that reference to refer to a person who was a prostitute. They say that there's a sinner, but she may not have been a prostitute, but they say that she was not a Christian. She is not a follower of Christ. She's a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at me in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. See another detail there. Sat and stood behind, uh, stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and then wiped them with her with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it and spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, see, you see why, why people are inclined to think that this is the same Simon that is mentioned in the other gospel. But you see, you had a lot of people named Mary, and you also had a lot of people named Simon in the New Testament period. He says, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee, and he says, Mark to say on. And Jesus went on to give him a little illustration here as to what he, he meant to this woman. I said, well, I came into your house, and you didn't wash my feet. You didn't, you didn't give me the sort of treatment that this woman gave me. You, you are upset. Are you questioning whether well, I'm a prophet because I know him, know her to touch me? But you didn't do anything to show the, the honor. But this woman did it. All right? And he went on to say, verse 4, said, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. And to whom little is, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now, as I indicated, one of the important principles in the study of the word is that when you're trying to understand a text or context, it is always good to read a little ahead and a little behind. Now, if you go a little ahead, you will get the context in, in, in which this chapter comes. If you pick up from the first verse of chapter 7, it says, Now when he had ended all his sins in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. That's where he is. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent him, sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. All right, so we, we have here the, the centurion approaching Jesus, and, and he was in Capernaum. And if you read right through that context, um, that text, we go on to verse, let's go on to verse 10. He went to the centurion's house, the saint to the centurion's house, and they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been saved. So we see the healing of the centurion servant, and where Jesus was, he was in Capernaum. And it said in verse 11, and it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he had come nigh to the gate, behold, there was a dead man carried out, and the son of his mother. And she was the widow, and much people of the city were with her. And the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, weep not. Jesus, and Jesus touched the young man, and he was healed. Verse 17 says, and this rumor of him went forth through all Judea and through all the region, and the disciples of John, watch this carefully, the disciples of John showed him all these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus and said, Are thou he that shall come, or shall we look for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Are thou he that shall come, or look for another? All right? So watch this. We saw Jesus in Capernaum, and we saw him going to Nain, where he's performing healing. We saw John the Baptist sending 
I'm, I'm, I'm asking Jesus, are you the one or we should look for another? This tells us that John the Baptist is still alive when this account that followed, because it's in the same chapter, all this is the same chapter. If you read on, I didn't want to go to work for, for the purpose of time, but it, 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 it gives you all of what was happening and what Jesus said back to John and said to him, to his disciples. And then, verse 36, when John said, and one of the Pharisees deserted him that he would come and eat. That's one of the Pharisees who were present. All of that that was happening said, um, Jesus, come and eat. So, so that supper that was prepared, folks, would have been prepared about two years before the accounts that we are given in John, in Mark, and in Matthew. Luke is not dealing with the same anointing. This is an event that took place in Capernaum, or, or in Nene, was part of, 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 of that region. And it's not in Bethany. The other accounts that we have in the other gospels, the other gospels are related to what happened in Bethany just before Jesus was crucified. And at only time he would have entered in, um, into Jerusalem, that period of time that's dealing with the final week. This here is dealing with John the Baptist is still alive. So we are talking about two years prior to what the other accounts are given. So it's not the same. Now people question, but the details look so similar. What happened looks so similar. But the reality is, is that there are certain traditions that those people establish in which they show honor. And word gets around when people do these things and people will duplicate them. It does not mean it's the same event where you see similar activities because these are the way people honored um, people who were important to them. Just like the people put families in, on, on the street, that's not, Jesus is not the only person they would have done that for. That's a custom of being a, 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 a dignitary or honored person is coming into the city, the people move out of the city and meet that person and greet them and, and bring them into the city, which they did for Jesus. In a similar way, the Pharisees to show um, hospitality, or the Jews, I should say, when a person enters their house, their, their house they will wash their feet as the same hospitality. That's why Jesus reprimanded um, the Pharisee here and said, but I came into your house and you didn't show any honor to me by washing your feet. But look what this lady has done and she's a sinner. The customs and that's why people think they are the same event because they see similar things happening. An anointing of the feet, wiping with the with, uh, using um, expensive ointment or oils um, and those things. You see, because that's the way people function in, in, in their custom and do these things. And that's why you will see a similar representation. I will pause here to see if you are inclined to agree with me. So I am saying but from the context, all right, and I'll, I'll give you another part. If we skip over to chapter eight, chapter eight. And we're going to read from the first verse in chapter eight. It says, and it came to pass afterward, that's after that, that event I was just describing in chapter seven, came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the 12 were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirit and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Harris Chores, and Susanna, and many others. That's why women came and ministered to Jesus, which ministered unto him out of their substance. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spoke by a parable. Now, so after that event, Jesus goes to a number of different cities, preaching the gospel and publicizing the things of the kingdom. So it could not be the same event that took place in the other gospels because Jesus had no time to go to other cities, preaching the gospel and casting out demons and healing people because Jesus has entered Jerusalem to die. It is, it is his last week. And all he's doing is moving from Bethany to Jerusalem, back to Bethany, into Jerusalem, back to Bethany, until he gets arrested in the Garden of, Gets of Gethsemane, where we say the Garden of Gethsemane, but in the Garden. And, and then he is crucified. So that is the evidence. That's what I say. When you look at details, you analyze them, 
that's how you discover the truth and you come up with things that when people challenge that question, you can say, but wait, Luke is not talking about the same thing that Matthew, Mark, and John are speaking about. He's talking about a different event, so place at a different time in a different place. So it can be the same event. I pause. Tell me what you think about that analysis. And if you'll be inclined to agree. If I get too long of silence, it will tell me that you agree. All right, while you're thinking, we could go to the others. I think so we have Richard and Ralph to respond. What do you have the question? Uh, Sir Richard? Yes, remember to unmute your phone. Yeah, let, let's let's elder Lord, but I'm not sure if you want to ask a question. Yeah, the hand is up, but I'm not sure. You might still have his phone muted. Maybe, maybe he didn't take it down for me last time. Maybe. Oh, okay, probably. All right, let's so let's proceed. Let's look at the one in John. Hello, 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 hello. Yes, Hello. yes, my lord. Yes, um, I agree with you that there were two okay. events, two different events. Yeah, I agree with that. But just let oh. me add that it was easy in those days for those ladies to wash um, Jesus' feet because of how they sat when they ate. They used to sit down. The, the tables were much shorter than ours. And they used to sit down and incline on, I think, the left side. So their feet were, were stretched out. So, so the lady would not have to go under the table when he was eating to wash his feet. Mm -hmm. If you understand what I mean. The feet were stretched out. Um, they're inclined to, towards the table to eat. And therefore, it was easy for the women to just come in and wash his feet. In other words, they did not use to sit down like we sit down these days around the table. If you understand what I mean. Yeah, yes. Right. So you so you are saying then that you're inclined to agree that Luke's account is not connected to what John yes. asked you on Mark. Yeah, two different, two different right. things. Right, okay. okay. So, way, so that's what he was suggesting this time. I was going to try to make it. Yeah, it was easy to wash Jesus' feet and anybody else's feet because they were stretched out behind. And they would not have had to go under the table to wash to wash anybody's feet in those days. Okay. Uh, you have a question or a comment from Ralph, Brother Ralph, Ralph Hinkson. Yes, Brother Ralph. Forget the unmute, brother Ralph. Yes, sir, Ralph, go ahead with your question or comment. Um, Reverend Jama, I think that brother Ralph is having some issues with his mic. Oh, okay. If if he can post it in the in the chat, I I, I guess he can go ahead and do that. All right, well, Jeff, you look for that if you post it, and then you can give me the question. We can we can proceed with the second one. You look at John, St. John chapter 12. Before that, I think um, Peter was, um, I had a query. Um, he, did you, he wanted to know your opinion on the same woman. You want to know my opinion on? Sorry, the question, question would have been, how do you view this woman?
How, how do I go out with the woman? How do you view this woman? The, the, and the I'm woman? sure also expand on that a little bit. How do I view the woman in, in um, St. Luke? I believe that to be the case. But the Bible says she was a sinner. Um, I, I said earlier that, that sometimes people conclude that when you see that mention of a woman, it, it's just a nice way of saying that she was a prostitute rather than saying it directly that she was a harlot or a prostitute. Sometimes it would say that she was a sinner. I said, well, that, that could be true, but we, we don't have it conclusively said here. It said that she was a sinner. So that's what we would have to, to, to work with, that she was a sinner means that she was not a saved person. She was not a follower of Christ. And then we, we, we said, we saw later down, Jesus was actually saying she was forgiven of her sin because of her faith. So she was a person who needed forgiveness. Whether or not she was a prostitute or, or, or not, um, I, I, I don't think that that was the significant aspect here. That's what concerned the Pharisee. But that didn't concern Jesus because she is a woman that was showing um, honor and respect to him and, and a contrite heart to be able to do that. So that's all I can say about the woman that is that she was a sinner and she needed to have the grace of God in, in her life, which she did get from Jesus. That's what he was saying in relation to that. Okay, I hope that that um, answers the question. Um, Sandra, they've given an update. She suggested that she agrees with what you suggested earlier and now she has She's of the opinion that there are three different anointings. So I guess we will go okay. further later on. Good. And we, will, and we will see that now. And, and, and that really is the correct, the correct thing here. There are three. And I would say that Matthew and Mark give the similar one. But John is different. And when we look at them, we will see the details. We'll, we'll bear it out. John chapter 12 says, Then six days before the Passover, then Jesus, sorry, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. This is the verse that we are looking at so often. Where Lazarus was, which had been dead. Specifying who you're talking about here. Whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper. Martha served. And Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary. Specify who here. A, a, not a woman now. It's Mary. A pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the order and anointment. That's a similar custom. The details are similar because it's a traditional way of showing honor. Then says one of his disciples, Judas is carrying. In the Luke's account, it was the Pharisee that complained, not one of the disciples, the Pharisee who complained. And the complaint was different. Listen for Judas' complaint. Simon's son. Which shall betray him. See, another thing we here mentioned again. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then Jesus said, Let her alone against the day of my burial. Have she kept this? He didn't say that of the woman who anointed him first. But he's now saying that Mary was, is coming closer to the time of his death. And he's saying that this is the sign of his burial. She's, and and his, her anointing is preparing for that. For the poor, you always have with you. But me, you don't always have. All right? So that was his um, record there. All right? So we go to the other two now. So this is six days before the Passover. Matthew now, chapter 26. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, I'm on, I'm on verse 6. And Jesus was in Bethany. See, where he is again, it's in Bethany. John said he was in Bethany. And he was in Bethany here again. Because remember, he's going from Jerusalem to Bethany. In the house of Simon the leper. The Luke account mentions Simon the Pharisee. It is Simon the leper. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation. John mentioned 
born speaking out. That's Judas. This says when his disciples saw they, they, that they had Ignatius saying, to what purpose is this waste? Uh, obviously, what some commentators are saying is that they, they might have been influenced by the response that Judas made yeah, when yeah. Jesus got the anointing at Mary's and Martha's um, house. So, so now they are making a similar response in a different setting. It's not the same anointing because that one was done six days before the Passover. This one, as we saw in our discussion already, was, was, was happening with two days to go um, for the Passover. But we saw that following this account as well as the one in Mark. We saw his disciples now, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said, Why trouble ye the woman? For she have brought a good word unto me. For the poor you always have. Same comment, but he have with, not with me. And some people are saying, well, Why would he make the same comment? It has in the same event. No, he said the same thing twice. Jesus went to the temple and walked through the money changes more than once. There are times you have to repeat the same instruction and give the same information for people to get the point that you're making. And we see the Bible have often repeated things. Ready? For in, in that she has poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Ready? I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, they shall also this that this woman have done because because the tool for a memorial of her. All right. Then one of the twelve called Jesus went to the chief priest, and he 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 moved on. Now and then it went on. Now the day of the feast of the unleavened bread. The disciples came just saying, Where are we going to be pretty fast over? And we had already said that that event was two days before um, the Passover. Because if you read earlier up in the, in the chapter at verse two, it said, You know that after two days in the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And it goes on to mention the details that followed there. So John's account was six days before the Passover. This account here in Matthew is two days before. Passover, and I'm saying the one in Mark chapter 14 is, is basically a repeat of the same event. So Matthew and Mark deal with the same event, Luke deals with a different event, and so they join. But I will conclude that Matthew, Mark, and John deal with an event that took place close to Jesus' crucifixion. As Luke one was much, much, much earlier. Okay, Luke chapter 14. It says, After two days of the feast of the Passover, that's the first verse on another bread. And the chief priest and his scribes saw how they might take him by craft, etc. etc. Again, that established the timeline. And they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, agrees with Matthew, Simon the leper, specific. He saw that meat, there came a woman with an alabaster box of ointment, spiking her up, and was very precious, and she brought the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation. Matthew said the disciples, some of the disciples, and Mark said, and there were some that had indignation within themselves, and said, why this way? Same language. For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She has brought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever, whensoever you will, you may do them good, but ye, but me, ye have not always. She have done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. I say unto you, wherever the gospel shall be preached in the world, this also shall that she have done shall be spoken of as a memorial for her. All right. So the account in Matthew and Mark relate the same anointing. That's the one that was done two days before he was crucified. John talks about six days before he was born, um, before the feast of the Passover, and specifically where he was. Other two, Matthew and Mark mentioned in the house of Simon the leper. Luke mentions in Simon the Pharisee's house. And as I said, that was a different occasion 
So my conclusion and my assessment is that they're not one and the same and that the Bible is making the state in, in relating the account of the same event. It is not. They're dealing with three different events. One mentioned in Luke earlier, the three others in the, in the other gospels mentioned close to Jesus' time of departure from this world, but on, on different times. One, six days before when he had come in to um, Bethany after his long journey from Jericho, tired and hungry, and Mary and Martha showing their hospitality and doing a good deed because he had raised Lazarus from the dead and they're returning, a wonderful thing, giving some supper to eat. And then after that, he went into Jerusalem the following day. And that is a different anointing. So my conclusion is that there were three and that there was not one with all these different details that are contradictory or um, are not showing the accurate details. So it's nine o'clock. If you agree with that, uh, I, I, I would think that I will get silence. If you disagree with that, <laughs> give me an opportunity to say so and ask any questions that you may want at this point. Then we will conclude. And that's what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. You, you can get the truth from the Bible if you take your time to study it and not just read it. Analyze it and be meticulous in your details. And we, we, we can defend it once we study it. And that's why the word instructs us to study it, show ourselves approved, greatly dividing. And there are easy reconciliations and solutions to a lot of things that people question as inaccuracies or contradictions once we study and we, 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 we get the details. And that's what I have been trying to do. I'm, I'm encouraging you to do that. I used to, to look at the, um, the lineages that are given in the Bible and gloss over them and figure out, oh, they are born and all those details, who be gap, who, and, and then how many sons and daughters they had and who be gap, who, until I began to realize how, how significant those lineages are in point, you know, um, the, the races and the connections. And, and, and began to see how many black persons are in those lineages when people are inclined to think that the Bible is a book about many whites. And, and, and I really now do not read the Bible um, casually. I, I give detailed examination to whole other things because you can miss a lot of truth by glossing over things. And that's why. You know, it's important that we, we study the word like that, and I will hope that you will do that. So that's it from me for tonight. It's nine o'clock. I will pass over to Jeff. I remember we're still going to continue this. So if you have any questions that you want to raise, as you look over those passages, we are going to look at some more apparent looking contradictions with the crucifixion and the details that were given, like the inscriptions on the cross, etc. Read that one. And who were at the tomb and lane. Those things we have to look at. Because we get little different nuances in there that suddenly make people think that they're, they're, they're um, the contradictions, but they're not. So thank you for engaging me tonight and for sharing. And we look forward to the next session. So do some more homework and read up on the details on the crucifixion and the resurrection. And we will see how we can reconcile things that we have done tonight when they look like their contradictions. Thank you very much. <laughs>